Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. There are about 220,000 new cases of breast cancer diagnosed in women every year in the United States. That according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. It is, unfortunately, a fairly common problem. In fact, one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer during their lifetime. And the risk goes up as you get older. The good news is early detection and innovative treatments are helping more women survive longer with a breast cancer diagnosis. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and here to discuss is the director of the Breast Diagnostic Clinic at Mayo Clinic, Dr. Karthik Ghosh. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Ghosh. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much, Tracy, and thank you, Dr. Hashives. Yep, Dr. Ghosh, thanks for coming. You know, we have known for a long time, and I think it's still true, that mammograms are the gold standard when it comes to detecting breast cancer, screening for breast cancer. But still some controversy, right? Uh, and, and the controversy, the latest that I have seen, has to do with when you ought to start getting mammograms. So what does the Mayo Clinic say? So Mayo Clinic currently still recommends that starting screening mammogram at age 40 is the guideline for our, our patients. Well, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force kind of came up with guidelines in the last couple of years that suggested that perhaps women 40 to 49 um, may or may not need regular screening. Well, I think the, the whole concern there is when women, younger women, have dense breast tissue and that perhaps uh, are we picking up cancers appropriately in that population and when they are younger, they're is the mortality benefit as significant? Well, one of the things here is, I think this is one of the areas where we need to have a thorough education of the patient. So informing patients, what are the pros and what are the cons of doing yearly screening mammography? I think the benefit is early detection. And uh, yes, young women too can have breast cancer. So starting at age 40, uh, the recommendation is yearly screening mammography, but having a discussion with your physician, the benefits of early diagnosis, the false negatives is another issue with these women because of the fact that women 40 to 49 have dense breast tissue and understanding that that may be an issue of concern and that uh, for that population supplemental screening or screening in addition to mammography may be of benefit. So having a thorough discussion of pros and cons of false positives with mammography and the false negatives, I think all of that is very important for that population. Mm -hmm. You uh, talked about dense breasts, and if I understand correctly, uh, if I'm right about this, up to 50% of, of women, particularly younger women, have dense breasts, That's and that right. the mammogram is not a very good test for detecting cancer in those women. That's exactly right. Um, uh, what we've seen is that for women with dense breasts, about half the population, yes, has dense breast tissue. Uh, half the population of women going through screening mammography have dense breast tissue. And when we talk about dense breasts, what it means is on a mammogram, when a woman has an X-ray of the breast, there is areas of the breast that look white, and that is usually the glandular tissue. The milk glands with some fibrous tissue around it look white. Fat tissue looks black or dark. And what we're trying to assess is a lump at the breast that generally looks white because a lump grows, the cancer grows within the milk gland. So on mammography, you're trying to find a white mass within white tissue. Mm. And that's what makes breast density a challenge. Um, so when in those women, when uh, your mammogram identifies you to have dense breasts, the mammogram report describes you have either heterogeneously dense breast tissue or extremely dense breast tissue. When your mammogram states that, that means you have dense breasts and that means the ability of the mammogram to pick up smaller cancers is limited. And those are the situations where it's reasonable to approach and have a discussion with your doctor. Should I be doing more? Should I be doing supplemental screening? And we do have a lot of uh, options available to our patients um, when they have dense breast tissue, and it's important to discuss that. What, what are those options? So first of all, we look at women who are at very high risk. So we, the American Cancer Society back in 2007 came up with screening guidelines for women who need to do an MRI in addition to a mammogram. So first of all, we assess 
does the patient qualify to have yearly screening MRI? That would be women who have a known BRCA1 or 2 mutation, first degree relatives who have off BRCA1 or 2 mutation carriers who have not been tested, women who have had chest radiation from Hodgkin's disease, and uh, also those with a family history that puts you with an estimated lifetime risk of over 20%. Those are women where we recommend that in addition to mammography, they would benefit from doing yearly screening MRI. Well, for the rest of the population of women who have dense breasts who don't qualify for MRI, one of the tests we have uh, is 3D mammography. The 3D mammography, also called tomosynthesis, is currently fairly well available, uh, widely available, and uh, is a tool that has actually been built into the mammogram. So when a patient goes for the mammogram, you get a 3D mammogram. Uh, the benefit of 3D is actually reducing recall rates. So when you go for your test, you know they call you back and say, well, there was a fold in the tissue. We, we need to stretch that out and repeat it. So it reduces recall rates. It helps to pick up a couple. So it, the way we look at a benefit of a screening test is first assessing how many more cancers can that test pick up. So in general, it is stated that if you screened 1,000 women with mammography, you end up picking up about four cancers. So that's the general statistic there. Well, if you added a 3D mammogram, you may pick up another one to two cancers. Well, that's benefit in addition to mammogram. And now we have molecular breast imaging. This is something that a lot of research has been done by my colleague, Dr. Deborah Rhodes, and a whole team of radiologists here at Mayo. And we now have it available where our patients are going through this as a supplemental screening. The beauty of this test is that it has the ability to pick up another eight to nine cancers per thousand women. So clearly there is benefit on adding some of a supplemental screening like that. MRI, of course, is the best screening test, but like we said, you know, it can pick up about 12 to 14 additional cancers per thousand women, but there are costs and there is um, false positives, which are a lot more with MRI. So I think that's why we have the MRI for the highest risk population. So clearly, 3D mammogram, but molecular breast imaging is probably what I would be, we generally recommend to our patients. At the other end of the spectrum, does anyone still recommend breast self exams? Or are we past that stage? <laughs> Great question, Tracy. You know, so there were studies done in large populations of women that showed that breast self-exams cause a lot of false positives and anxiety and so on. They change but, every day. But <laughs> I, I do think that familiarity with the breast is really important. This is part of every individual taking responsibility for their own bodies. And I think the more we're comfortable about what our breasts feel or look like, I think that is a good thing. So breast self-awareness is what we do encourage women. Be familiar with your breasts so that if something changes, you know I have to seek attention for this. So a lot of our patients actually come with lumps that they felt and not necessarily screen detected. So uh, I think I would still, I, we still encourage breast self-awareness. All right, it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month uh, this October, and we're talking with Dr. Kartha Ghosh. She is a Mayo Clinic breast cancer expert and also director of the Breast Diagnostic Clinic at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Time for a short break. When we come back, myth or matter of fact, small-chested women have a lower risk of breast cancer. Could it be? <laughs> You're listening to Mayo Clinic Radio on the Mayo Clinic News Network. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McCray. Well, it's October, and this is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and we are with the director of the Breast Cancer Diagnostic Clinic, Dr. Karthi Ghosh, talking about breast cancer, and we have so far talked about screening mammograms, and if you're at high risk, additional tests like an MRI scan, or if you have dense breasts, an MBI scan may be appropriate. But to start this segment, we've got a myth or matter of fact. Small-chested women have a lower risk of breast cancer. Is that a myth or a fact, Dr. Ghosh? I don't think that there is strong evidence <laughs> uh, one way or the other. I think there's, the question really is that if there is breast tissue that is hard to detect, so in larger-breasted women, sometimes it's hard to pick up deeper-placed malignancies, and I think that limits the ability of self-exams or being familiar with their breasts. It gets a little harder. 
but uh, no evidence that one way or the other we're protected. I think it's more, uh, let's be careful no matter what size the breast is. Let's talk about genetic testing for breast cancer genes. So uh, is that something that more and more patients are requesting or where are we at with that? Genetics is an area that is developing in leaps and bounds, I think, every year, every other day. We have something new. We're learning about it. Uh, and uh, we have uh, wonderful medical genetics experts that kind of help guide us. So this is something I would say, you know, it, women are asking more about it because there are different ways of doing gene testing. Um, and as pe people become more familiar with it, uh, it is an area that I think very appropriately they're asking good questions. So women with a family history of breast cancer, that's an opportunity to talk with your provider, your care provider, your clinician to say, what should I be doing? Do I need to go through gene testing? I do still strongly believe that genetics counseling is an important step prior to gene testing. So we generally recommend a visit with a medical genetics counselor so that you're well informed about Number one, is there a risk to my based on my family history? And then based on that, they can recommend what type of gene test to do, what are the po potential possibilities here. So for BRCA1 and 2 gene carriers, you know, there is a strong family history where there are multiple generations of women, in the women or men in the family in, uh, who have cancer, not only breast, but ovarian, colon, prostate, and uh, melanomas. Those are kind of common cancers within families in BRCA1 or 2 genes. Uh, but then there are other cancers associated with other, can uh, other genes associated with cancer syndromes. So gathering a detailed family history, not only of mo mom and dad, but paternal aunts and maternal aunts and uncles, grandparents, all of that is very important in that decision making. So a genetics counselor could really guide you, the patient on what is the best way to proceed. What, what at this point in time can genetic testing tell you and what can you or should you do with that information? Excellent. Yeah, the, the gene test can identify if you carry a gene mutation that puts you at high risk for breast cancer or ovarian cancer. For BRCA, like we said, there are other, gene, other cancers that you may be predisposed to. So if you did the test, it can tell you what cancers to be screened for and what kind of preventive measures you can undertake. So in terms of screening for BRCA carriers, we recommend quite close screening. You know, it's six monthly breast exams and six monthly checks with an imaging of some kind. So either mammogram with MRI, which is staggered at six monthly intervals. So very close monitoring. And of course, when the time is right, when the patient is ready, Preventive mastectomies are recommended. Um, preventive oophorectomies is the other thing, salpingo-oophorectomies. There's a lot of research going on in BRCA carriers and their ovarian cancer risk. So meeting with the gynecology expert in this area would also be very important. So it is Awareness Month. Let's talk about the signs and symptoms. What should women look for uh, before they even go in to see their doctor? What should they be on guard for? You, you certainly suggested that women ought to be familiar with yeah. their breast. But in addition to that, I mean, what, what changes or if they look in the mirror and see something, what, what should women be looking for? That's a great question. So basically, in the mirror, when you're looking at yourself, I think with your arms uh, raised, it gives an idea of whether there's retraction either of the nipple or if there's dimpling of the skin or if you see an area of patchy redness that is new. Anything that is new or a change from baseline is really what you're looking for and that's what helps you in terms of awareness. And, you know, I, I understand we don't want to feel individuals to be just overwhelmed and scared by this but I think it is just getting comfortable with you know when you feel your breasts on a regular or at least every so often you know what this area feels like you know you feel this this part of my breast has always been a little ridgy but if it's changed or if you say I didn't don't know if I felt this before well that's something that you need to get checked out. All right let's talk about risk factors we, we've, we've briefly discussed the fact that um, if you have a, fa a positive family history, that's certainly a risk factor. We know that the older you get, the more likely you are to get breast cancer. What, what, what other things um, are at, what puts women at risk? I think age is the biggest risk factor, like you said, uh, Tom. So uh, older age, uh, the greater as we get older, all women are considered at increased risk of breast cancer. Uh, like you said, family history. The other thing, you know, the rest of the factors, mammographic breast density, 
is considered a risk factor. So the denser your breasts are, there's concern that you may be at in somewhat increased risk. The challenge here is how do we bring it to clinical practice? How do we educate a patient? You know, young women have dense breasts, but that doesn't mean that every young woman is at increased risk. So there's a lot of work going on in this area to how do you individualize that risk of density per pay, uh, for your patient. And so that's an area of evolution, and I think we will be coming back to talk about this in the next few years as we get more individualized information. Now, um, having... Uh, women who have not had children, the thinking is that there your breast tissue is still not matured through pregnancy and breastfeeding, that it may be somewhat prone to. Um, so, And then breastfeeding is protective. That's a, a benefit in terms of uh, uh, risk of breast cancer. So how do we reduce the, the risks? Yep, so let's talk about prevention. Oh. That's so important. So one other thing I wanted to add is uh, tissue changes. You know, there are women who have had breast biopsy that shows atypical hyperplasia. Atypical hyperplasia is considered one of the strong risk factors for future development of breast cancer. And there is something we can do for those women where estrogen blocker therapies can actually lower the risk. And there's been enough research showing the benefits there. So if you have had a breast biopsy, it's important to check to see was there atypical hyper hyperplasia. And finally, prevention. What can women do to help to keep from getting breast cancer? That is a great question because there is plenty we can do. I think research is still evolving in this area, but one of the important things that every woman needs to be thinking about is a healthy lifestyle. There is data that regular exercise, a low cholesterol healthy diet, maintaining a healthy weight. These are very important in that they have shown to lower breast cancer risk. In addition, limiting alcohol intake. I think we really need to be careful about this. We generally say not prefer not more than three servings a week would be a good place to be because that does, uh, alcohol is a risk factor for breast cancer, specifically excess alcohol use. And then uh, limiting exposure to smoking environments. In addition to that, there are medications that have been clearly shown to reduce risk, and these are tamoxifen, raloxifene, eczemestane, and anastrozole, four medications that in large clinical trials have been shown to reduce breast cancer risk. We generally recommend that for women who are at increased risk, either because they have had a breast biopsy showing atypias, women with family history of breast cancer can certainly benefit from those agents. So, and the last and final is the preventive mastectomy reserved for women with a known gene mutation uh, where the patient, and that is a very much a patient-driven decision. All right, the keys, a healthy diet, exercise, and not too much alcohol. For most women, if you're at higher risk, there's other things you can do. Dr. Ghosh, thanks so much for being with us. It is October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Dr. Ghosh is a breast cancer expert and director of Mayo Clinic's Breast Diagnostic Clinic. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much, Tom and Tracy. Appreciate it.